we are talk about interpretable convolution neural net. So we'll try to explain what's going on in the convolution neural net. And so there is a certain philosophy how to do it. But anyway, before I say, uh, you know, people now use the uh, neural net, there are two kinds, convolution neural net and recurrent neural net. Here I focus on convolution neural net, and particularly the more relevant to the image uh, video processing. Um, if you have a data set, and actually uh, you have a lot of label data, uh, given that, then uh, usually the uh, CN give you the best performance. It's very hard to find a way to beat the CN. So CN performance now is almost, it's a, uh, the top, is a top 20, top 30 solution, different kind of CN, all in the top ranked method, okay. But it uh, involved the non-convex optimization. That means the parameter set of the CN usually extremely large. And people feel, of course, there's over, overfit. And also, there are many, many local minima. So you have a different initialization of the filter weight. And then you use the backward propagation to re, uh, adjust the filter weight to lower the cost. You get uh, many different solutions. So there are many, many different local minima. But for some reason, they all deliver good results. Okay, so it's like a, a, a little mystery. And people try to prove mathematically why the local minimal also give almost like global minimal performance. But generally, the rigorous theory only apply to uh, one hidden layer. So you have in, input, la input layer, output layer, and one hidden layer. You can have a very rigorous mathematics. Beyond that, two hidden layers, you don't have that rigorous mathematics let alone 100 layers, 150 layers. So it's almost, almost very difficult to, to use the math to analyze. But the most people doing the theoretical investigation try to use this non-convex optimization approach to understand that. And also, it has a lot of tricks. And uh, students usually don't learn the neural net from the professors because professors know very little about neural net. Because professors do not program, right? Professors know the high level thing. But neural net, they really don't know. They don't remember many, many network architectures. Good students need a, in the brain need to have a 50, 100 neural net architectures. And then do smart combination of different neural net architectures. And hopefully find a better solution. And professor brain does not have a lot of network architecture. They don't code, they don't program. So they normally know nothing. Okay? So I admit to my student, you know, if you need, a, you need a help, ask my TA, okay? I don't know anything about neural net. But actually, it's very good for high school students, too. So the elementary school, high school, because now the barrier is so low. Means you only need data, the images, labeled data, and then just the Keras, you know, TensorFlow, just a lot of existing software, GitHub, so many software, you just use it. And you don't, you don't need to know anything. Physics, chemistry, mathematics, zero, right? So it's uh, so friendly, extremely friendly, but it's also friendly to the elementary school students. So you study so hard, get a PhD, but then suddenly you spend too many years in something useless, right? So it's very disappointing. You should feel very bad about that. You shouldn't feel very good about that, okay? But anyway, there is also problems. And people, will, people know that. When you are given a new a narrow architecture, you are able to design adversary examples. So you are able to perturb. A dog can become a cat. A cat can become a horse. A horse can become something. You just try to adjust the weight and then change the input slightly. You just give some kind of small perturbation with the input. Human cannot see any difference, but the network decision will totally change. So it's very sensitive to some kind of attack. And this is very bad. People, particularly now the DAPA, a lot of military applications, so they really cannot trust this. Okay, but now it's easy to use, but it's also very easy to debug. You really don't know what goes, goes wrong. So the whole thing right now, it's uh, very chaotic, I will say. You know, a lot of people has, uh, if you ask people three years ago, four years ago, people are more lenient to that. Good performance is everything. But now, after several years, actually, people also feel 
many unanswered questions. Five years ago, you cannot answer. Today, you still cannot answer. Your progress is what? Progress application. Keep changing data set. Keep changing the, the solution. Once the solution, one data set becomes saturated, change another data set. So actually, the field becomes boring. It's not really intellectually ex ex exciting. It's just the change applications. So I don't have a problem with its application. Some application work. Some application may not work. And then you have to pray and see whether it works. Okay, so it's really a very bad situation. And people need to come away to clean up that. So after several years, I started from 2013, 14, until now. So I, after very, very long thinking, eventually I say, I give up optimization. I give up cost function. There is no backup propagation. There is no cost function to optimize. Totally, I just give up that. So people say, gee, you are so courageous. You give up backward propagation. What do you have? What do you have? I say, well, I still have a lot of things I will explain. But basically, what I try to say is that I want to design, actually, I want to given a neural net architecture, say, the NET5, the Kong five layer net neural net. I use exactly the same architecture. I don't change anything, just use architecture. The weight, how to choose the filter weight, I use a one pass V4. I just choose the layer one filter, finish it, and using the output to the layer two, and then design it and go layer after layer until it's output. Just one pass, no backward propagation, and see what the result. And you may guess you know, your result will be very, very bad. You know, for the MNIST, zero to nine handwritten, the backward propagation get the accuracy on the average is 99.1%, right? But using the fee for one pass, I will show you, I get a 97%. I don't have any optimization, no backward propagation, I get 97%. And also I have a way to improve this, uh, the method and even get a 99.3%, beat the backward propagation. So I will show you a lot of things right now we are able to do better than BP based and CN using one pass and using some other idea, okay? So in this talk, I will try to um, explain that design, and this is totally transparent, 100% understandable if you have a good signal processing background, okay? Lineage bra, statistics, that's it. You only need to know what covariance matrix means, what the principal component analysis, and what's the subspace approximation, and, and then that's all you need. And so you need a very, very basic uh, uh, mathematical skill to know this V4 design. And I want to try, I try to compare the performance. That's the today's game. Everything say performance, right? So we will perform. Complexity is so low. My student actually, older generation, they all use the backward propagation. New generation, they switch to V4 because that's a protocol is so fast. The training, just several minutes, they get a training result. Just one pass, so it's so fast. Um, we also try to uh, discuss the relationship between these two designs. Okay, so now what's the what tool you have? Um, if you talk about modern machine learning, modern machine learning, the idea basically is the all the input multimedia. You know, it doesn't matter is a speech, language, uh, images, graph. You all do embedding. Embedding means convert the input multimedia signal into a high dimensional vector. So for example, for image, each pixel is a one dimension. So if you have image size n by n, then you get n squared dimension, high dimension vector. So that's the, that's the input. And output, if you for doing the classification problem, output how many objects you want to classify, then the, that's the output dimension. Suppose you want to get 1,000 object classes, then you get 1,000 dimension output vectors. Okay. Then in the middle, layer after layer, we can say these are the transform of this kind of vectors. So you find the input, you go to layer one, you go to another vector, go to layer two, go to another vector until the output. So it's layer after layer transform. And the training data, you learn from training about how to do the transform. Training data, you have learned from training data to do the transform. And then testing data, just follow the rule. 
And this rule is a filter weight. Okay, so that's the basic idea. So for example, if you have an image, uh, 32 by 32 size, it's a very tiny image, and RGB three color. So then you time them together, get 3,000 dimension input. And the output is suppose you want to do the CFAR 10, you have 10 classes of output, so the output is 10. And then you, in the middle, you do some kind of a transformation, okay. So here, I showed one example. So this is called the LANE 5. So this input is zero to nine images, 32 by 32. There is only one monochrome, just one grayscale. So the dimension is 1024. And then this is output dimension 10. And in the middle, you have the um, different kind of two convolution layer and then two FC layer and one output layer. Okay. So here, you say, well, Professor Gore, you are talking about dimension reduction, right? You want to go to from high dimension to low dimension. So I expect you to do a lot of dimension reduction. But actually, if you see this architecture, you see, well, after one convolution, actually the dimension increase. So it becomes 4,000, right, 4,700. And then when you do the pooling, this is a two by two to go to one by one, then you do down sampling, then you drop. Then you also do another convolution, you go up, then you drop, 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 drop until 10. So you are, you are some, some place you have dimension expansion rather than dimension reduction. Why? The reason for that basically is that we try to use the multiple filter here, try to capture the local structure. So here, let's say, consider zero to nine. So you have stroke. So sometimes you have a, a vertical, a, a horizontal stroke, right? Sometimes you have the sort of the vertical stroke. Sometimes you have some kind of a curve. So these are your unit. So you cannot just using one filter to try to capture all different kinds of stroke. So you, Lacan suggests, look at six filters, okay? So we are able to design the six filters and you don't know which one it is. So you have used the six filter to scan through the whole images and then see the response to each filter, right? So, so in that sense, each, each point, the center point, will become six response. So actually, you try to use this time six. But you, get a, you don't get a six because you only have a 28 by 28 internal points. So a boundary effect save you a little bit so that you get six times this. So it's a 46, 4700. So basically, what I try to say is that actually, you want to get um, multiple filters and then scan through things. There are some filters more powerful. But there are other filters that are not very useful for one location. But the key is you want to do dimension expansion so that there is some dimension has a stronger signature, has a good match. You don't know what, what it is, but you want it has a good thing inside. So you want dimension expansion. But later on, you just try to reduce dimension. Okay. So you want to do dimension reduction. Basically, clearly, the input space is higher dimension than the output. So you need dimension reduction. But the, it's another tribute to dimension reduction. You really want to keep the most important dimension, which help you discriminate things. So you want to keep the dimension with discriminant power. So uh, one, one dimension reduction is called principal component analysis, right? So you do the uh, principal component, which keep the, a lot of energy. And that's high frequency, don't keep a lot of energy. Then you are able to preserve the fidelity. Like DCT is considered is an approximate kahunen loiv transform for the uh, PCA, right? But now we use the PCA is a dimension reduction approach. Maximum pooling for two by two to, to be one by one, that's also a dimension reduction, right? Four to one dimension reduction. And also the clustering in the FC layer is also dimension reduction. And also, there are ways to increase the dimension discriminability, for example, nonlinear activation. So when you are doing all this kind of operation, you have to keep in mind, you reduce dimension, but you keep important dimension, which has the discriminant power. So you will make a decision based on really useful uh, dimensions. OK, so now let's look at the convolution layer. So there are two convolution layers. Here is the, the, um, the filtering operation. This one, just the pooling. So the, there is no filter to learn. And then this another filter you want to learn, and then this pooling you don't learn. Okay, so we talk about this. So in terms of filter, you can write down this way. K is just a different filter. So, so you have six filter, your K equal one to six. 
So filter is what? Filter is just a transform. You can look at this like a fine. So it's an inner product. So you have an input patch, five by five patch, and then they have weighted coefficient. So A is the weighting, weighting vector. You try to do the inner product, and then you add a, a bias. So this is the uh, filter, and you have to choose A, you have to choose B, okay? So that's filter design. And then there is a nonlinear equation. So it means um, you, have, you need to do that to uh, process the output and then to generate. So now the, the thing is, that in order to under, understand this, we have to understand this guy, phi. But phi is very difficult to understand. So the best way is try to avoid an, an, an analysis of phi. Get rid of it. But figure out a smart way to get rid of it. So the, my approach is uh, I, I hate you, but I eliminate your role. So just to kick you out, OK? And there is a standard way. There's a smart way to kick it out. And then also, uh, BK, I have to be very careful about the choosing BK. I want to choose BK so that this BK will not affect my next layer operation. So I want to make a BK to be extremely simple so that the next layer, it will not give me a lot of trouble. And then eventually, really, I need to do is about AK. And AK also, there is a very uh, simple idea how to do that, okay? So here it's a, a filter weight. So one is using BP. So this is just a parameter. So we give up. We don't do that. The second viewpoint, we consider um, this filter weight is obtained from the training data. It's like a match filter. So I have the first layer. The input is a 5x5 five five patch. I collect the many, many 5x5 five five patch, and I cluster into six clusters. Then I pick the centroid as the filter match filter. So that's the way that I can match one of the six, right? I can match all of them and see which one gives the more strong correlation and so on. So that's a match filter idea. Actually, I can use this idea came in clustering stage by stage, layer by layer, and get the final result. But the final result is very disappointing. If you do the k-mean initialization and just one pass, the accuracy is 25%. Okay, if you do the uh, MNIST. So if you do the random initialization without any BP, you get 10%. 10% means random guess. You have 10 classes, you, you don't see anything, you get it to 10%. So if you do random, you can get 10%. But if you do the k-mean clustering to choose the filter weight, you get 25%. So you should be smile, right? It's 25%. But of course, if you go to talk to Lacan, you know, I only do fee four design, get 25%, you get 99%. You know, go home, right? Don't talk to me, right? So this won't work, okay? So this we have to give up. This is some idea I worked like uh, three years ago, so I'm using K-Mean. So now the new way is that you have to think about this A, actually they are correlated, they are working together. So now I look at A, it's a vector, but they form a space, this a linear algebra, this A, different A, K equal one, K equal two, the K equal six. They are the they they are all 25 by 25. Uh, they are all five by five, 25 dimension. But they form a subspace. You know, if you have patched 25 dimension, you should have a 25 bases, right? But I only allow you to select six, so it's a subspace. It's a six out of 25. So now I look at subspace approximation. So now we look at this. It's a hypersphere in a 25 dimension space, and A1 to A6, just the uni vector on the sphere, and X actually right now temporarily I put on also on the sphere, so that this X is actually running around, can go to any place, and then if you do the inner product, the, the summation term inner product, you can look at X project to A, you also can consider A project to X, okay, so let's consider, given the X, all the A project to X. So, if you have a theta less than 90 degree, all the projections are positive. But if the theta greater than 90 degree, all the projections become negative, right? And so this space spent by the AK, and this is a projection. YK is a response, is a projection. But the rectified linear unit, ReLU, basically says, if your projection is a negative, it's a negative, I kill it. I don't want any negative part. I only preserve the positive part. 
The, the positive part, I do just a linear. Just get whatever you, you, you have. But if you project to this side, I rectify it. I clipping. I just use rectify clip. So these are rectify. Okay? Why? Very mysterious, right? Actually, there is also a sigmoid and the leaky ratio. But we can use this to explain, or basically try to use This also can be explained. So here, let me show you the, some uh, example. So consider this each one is one pixel. The black and white, each one is one pixel. So if I consider five by five, it's this shape. So this shape is three black and two white in the middle. OK, so if we have an anchor vector of this shape, so this region, five by five, do the inner product of this, we can get the, you just take out the mean, just look at AC. So if you do the inner product, you should get a one, right? Okay, so this one. But if you shift the, to the right by one pixel, become this guy, the yellow guy, three white, two black, like this, then this is uh, out of phase. So this inner product will be minus one. So there is a plus one, there's a minus one. But now the question is, if I have to do the, because I have a next layer, I have a next layer, the next layer, the link can be positive sign or negative sign, right? So if I do the positive correlation and then the output, the, the link is a positive. So positive time positive, you get a positive. But if you have the negative pattern, so negative, but all going is a negative. Negative time negative is also positive. So these two cases, you don't know which case. So in other words, this part and this part, if you time this, you get a negative. But when the response go to the next layer, there is a negative sign of the output link, then you will be swap, switch around, and then it becomes the same as this guy and with a positive output link. So in other words, you really don't know this guy is here or here. You don't know which is case. You have the confusion. So you have to resolve this confusion. And so the resolve confusion basically says, well, if you have the neck correlation, I kill it. I don't allow it. By only positive, I allow it. So this is like the, you kill the negative correlation. You kill the negative correlation. So that only allows the positive correlation, and then the output is positive, negative is okay. So that's, this, uh, we call this called the sign confusion. Okay. So if you can resolve this using the rectifier, actually you make things much easier to analyze. And actually, my friend told me there is a human brain, the layer one, there is also operation suppress the out of phase. Something of out of phase, you will suppress it. So if we go back to the previous one, say, well, if I kill this guy, because this guy is out of phase. This guy is in phase. Will I lose information? The answer is no. Why? Because if you move two pixels to the right, you get three black and two white. You cover that again. You move down, you also get this. So actually, this yellow region can be recovered by choose proper blue region. So you choose the proper region, you get all positive response. It still covers the whole region. You can reconstruct this region. I don't need you. The, you destroy me. You give me confusion. I take it all you, then everything very consistent. The world is very beautiful. So we just kill that. That's also out of phase. But why you need to do that? Two layer. If you don't have multi-layer, you don't need this. Single layer, you don't need it. But once you have two layer, a neural net always has one hidden layer, at least, right? So neural net starting at least two layer. This comes from that. So say, well, why I learned Fourier transform, wavelet transform, I don't need to worry about that. They all single layer, sparse coding. But wavelet is the first two layer algorithm. So you use the rectifier to kill those confusion. So that's very easy to explain. I mean, some people explain something very difficult, but I don't think, again, I'm not that smart. I don't understand that. I understand this, very simple. This is elementary school student knowledge, right? So anyway. Um, so it's blocked the, the, the second second case. Uh, okay, now another issue is why you do the subspace approximation. So it's come from the record transform. Record transform is a rectified correlation on the sphere. But now I want to do inverse. What's the inverse means? In the record transform, basically give a patch, I want to find the projection. I want to find the PK. Inverse transform means give you the AK, give you the dictionary. This is a dictionary. I give you the projection. 
I want you to reconstruct the signal, F. Okay. So, um, and then even more is uh, rectified. So sometimes you, you, you real operation is uh, if you negative, you kill it, right? So they only have positive response. So in other words, the case one is I give you the projection value. I give you the A. You tell me what X. Second case, I don't allow you to have this. You only have this, and you reconstruct the X. Okay. So then the way you want to reconstruct the F, you basically write F in terms of linear combination of the basis, right? This is a, we'll call it anchor vector. Okay, and then how to find, AK is already given, that's a dictionary. So how to find the alpha? So basically you just project to this different AK, and you should get the BK, PK you know, and the AK you know, you just solve the alpha, and the alpha will be the F head approximation, right? So you just a uh, subspace. But if you look at this long enough, then you will, you will have several intuition. Number one, you want to uh, get the orthogonal basis. That makes the inversion very easy. Right? When you do inverse transform, you really don't, you want the base orthogonal. So you want the orthogonal. And second, you want, you want to get fidelity. You want the, the approximation error as small as possible. And then we know we want to preserve the maximum energy. And then L2 known, basically, it's lead to the principal component analysis. So, um, so we use the principal component analysis to get the orthogonality and also get the maximum energy. So that means given the filter number, we want to make approximation error as small as possible, L2 norm. So then that's the uh, PCA come out. Um, so you can get more filter, but basically you just have a smaller, smaller approximation error. And of course, it depends on the input data. So for simple zero to nine, six filter is enough. But for other things, you maybe need more filter. But the filter number just relate to approximation capability. Another is about the rectification loss. Rectification loss, because of nonlinear activation, you kill something and you only has a part, right? So, so for X, you keep this and you throw away that. But X move around. X may come to here, then you throw away that and you, you keep something. So this is very tricky. You make the analysis very difficult. Which one you, you have? So I propose two ways to handle this. One, I call the subspace approximation with argument kernel, so SAC transform. SAC transform means what? If AK is a basis, is a vector, anchor vector, minus AK also, yeah. So originally I have six, now I give you 12. So A1 to A6, minus A1 to minus A6. So when you do projection, if you get a positive, the other one will negative. But when you get the projection negative, the other one will be positive. So among the 12, six will be positive, six will be negative. And you kill the six one, you keep the six one. Then you don't lose anything. Okay. So it's very nice, and we, we develop like that. But some students say, Professor Guo, you are not doing CN. You're doing your own suck transform. You know, it seems like okay, but you're not doing CN. So I say, okay, you know, my PhD is a lot of old generation is very critical to me. They, they, you know, because I'm very tough on the CN, so they're also very tough on me, you know, so keep uh, challenging me. So I say, well, now I will do the CN. Okay, I really do CN, so I, I don't want to do this, double the anchor vector. But then what I can have? I, I have a B. I never use B yet. I assume B is like uh, take it away, but now I put B back. So B is what? B, I put it's a, uh, there is subspace, I can consider, subspace, uh, signal decomposition, there is a DC subspace, there's an AC subspace. And DC subspace is what? It's uh, the, the vector point to the one, 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 one direction. So any element is one. So this is a DC component. All the dimension, the same value. So it's called the constant element vector. And the AC will be others. So AC, you add them together, will be zero. But DC is a constant. And this actually, double students should know this because electronic circuit. You, you do that because when we design, when we do a lot of circuit analysis, we always do the AC analysis. But when we go to the lab, we all know we put the things to be a DC, right? You say it's several millivolt, positive, negative, and we never care about the real thing. But when you go to the lab, everything plus five volt, the bias, right? That's the really the, the double E training. So I, I didn't, you know, all my undergraduate professor something. I remember what he told me, and I used it here. Okay. So bias vector now just become a DC. And the reason I want to make that is I want to make a cascade very, very simple. 
And also, I want to do one thing. I want to overcome this is positive negative. I add some bias so that it's always positive. Then I bypass this guy. This guy does not exist, ZK equal YK. So this guy does not need it. And this, adding this, basically just guarantee the sign, always positive. And this one make me, the analysis, this BK can be absorbed by the DC filter. Whenever I have a, a, a thing, say input image, also there's a local mean, right? Local, local averaging. But I use the DC filter to attract the mean, local mean, and then rest will be AC. So all the analysis I'm talking about, the AK part, A part is AC, and B is DC. Okay, so then make the analysis very, very simple. I think the EIE people should like the, this kind of approach. This is exactly the EIE major, right? So anyway, so, and how to choose B? B just, uh, actually X doesn't have to be the, along the hypersphere. X can be anywhere, and then B just uh, greater than or equal to the maximum, the maximum X, the magnitude of the maximum, and that's it, okay? So it depends on the input distribution. So you look at the input distribution, see what's the maximum magnitude, and choose that. And if you really are not sure about this, just add something a little bit bigger. It's not a problem. So that's the design. You choose the, uh, you want the one filter to be a DC filter, and the other five is principal component, up the DC removal. And then the B is a constant a vector, and you choose greater than that. And okay, now I want to talk about the pooling. So you have do the filter and the response is here, the filter response here. Now I want to reduce the spatial, uh, spatial dimension. So this is a, a six by six local region and the filter is five by five, center at A. So there is a red box center at B and C and D, okay, different box. So now A, B, C, D, they are four lo location, response location. And I want to reduce the dimension. So I say, choose one for me. You say, no, I don't want to choose one, I want everything. Oh, you don't want everything, you don't do dimension reduction. You need to do dimension reduction. So I say, well, choose one. And suppose these are uh, horizontal stroke. This filter is horizontal stroke. These are all the same filter. Another filter may be the vertical stroke, right? So if you do the horizontal stroke, and A, B, C, D, they say differently which one you want to choose. You want to choose, again, preserve the fidelity, maximum response, give the strongest uh, fidelity, right? So you just have four response, choose the maximum one, and then that means under this six by six, you see the choke, what's the strongest choke response, and that's it. And then another filter, you again, you choose, this part is nonlinear, okay? So the PCA actually is a spectral pooling. So you have 25 dimension principle, uh, so 25 dimension PCA, if you have four, but you cut it, you choose the most important one and throw away other. This is so spectral pooling. You pull the maximum spectral component. A maximum pooling is spatial pooling. You, you, you also pull the maximum spatial component. So these are dual concept. Okay. Um, now another thing is about the, the um, why you need cascade, why you, why you need multi-layer. Actually, if you look at this, why you need the first filter five by five? Suppose you don't have five by five filter. What means? I give you one pixel. So zero to nine, I give you one pixel. I ask you, where did this come from? Which image? Can you see one pixel to see zero to nine? You say, are you kidding? This is ridiculous, right? Then I give you five by five. You say, I, you see five by five. Can you tell me it's zero to nine? It's very difficult because five by two is so too small. But if I give you two layer, this two layer, the receptacle here is corresponding 14 by 14. So I give you this kind of 14 by 14 field and ask you whether it's zero to nine. You, even though you cannot have 100% confidence it is what, but you know it cannot be one, it cannot be uh, seven, it cannot be something, right? You see this part, it can be zero, it can be eight. So when you go deeper, you can large, get a, a larger receptive field and you have a stronger uh, discriminant dimension, okay? So that's really the, the purpose, you go to deeper. But when you go to too deep, actually you really don't just see whole image already, so there's no need to go to too deep, okay? But how, after all this, I want to start to talk about something different, okay? So BP actually is different from the feed forward design. This BP, basically this is the BP design uh, CN, and this is AlexNet. So in the layer five of AlexNet, there is a certain filter 
It has a very strong response to all the cat face images. And passing this filter, if you go to that filter response and you do deconvolution, you go back to the input, these are the deconvolution field to look like. And you can see they all like a very, it's all like the cat face. So this filter is just one filter, one filter response, very strong, and then it gives you this. So this is really, actually, it's really match filter. This really match filter. So in other words, when you do the match filter, you cannot do feed forward design. When you want to do match filter, you have to do BP. BP will help you to find something very, very powerful and then go to the decision. So BP actually is a very uh, good uh, uh, match filter, but it's a very expensive match filter. V4, no such thing, but it's a it's subspace uh, uh, approximation. So here I want to say BP actually can generate a very spatial pattern and in a filter, it's a compound filter after multi-layer cascade, and it's tailored to a salient part, which has a discrete power, and also uh, which is occur often. If something does not occur often, you don't need to put a filter there, because the cost function will not change too much. So you have occur often, and also very discriminant. Then you will design the filter to fit that through the optimization, automatically done for you. So it's really match filter. BP actually doing the very compound match filter. But V4 does not do that. And actually, the Korean realm tend to be spread out because of like uh, you, you have step function, you project the Fourier. It's very spread out, right? So it's very spread out. It's weaker and not as discriminant as the BP. BP has that cat face filter I don't have. I have a, a lot of filter response to synthesize the cat face. OK? So, we look at BP actually is a compound match filter. V4 just projection to the uh, space. But BP, you need a price to do iterative optimization to find the match filter. Here I just do the PCA. PC is sparse. So just a lot of a couple filter is very, very powerful. But V4 is a dense. You use many filter response to form a, 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 a pattern. And BP is like sparse coding. You have redundancy. V4, no. Also going on, there's no also going on, but V4 is also going on, uh, uh, the anchor vector. So the correlation, if you match very strong, it doesn't match, it's very weak. But V4 just match every, every one and with different response. And in terms of the BP, it's actually narrow band signal. You have just that filter. If you kill that filter, then the cat will, you will not see the cat face. So that filter is very important. And V4 is a broad, broad band. So, in terms of communication, you all know, CDMA is very robust to interference. If you have a narrow band signal, you can use a jammer to kill that, right? The jammer is a, you can view is like a diversity attack. But if you have a broadband CDMA, you put some jammer, I don't care because I have so many coefficients. You kill me 1%, 2% coefficient, I still have 98%. So Broadband and the narrow band actually, in some sense, actually the modern communication go broadband, not really go narrow band, right? So a lot of EIE people can really inspire. This is CN actually really a lot of communication thing. Some information theory all can play some role. Okay, so and also you can use the cross entropy to measure the discrete power. So when I gave the talk in Technion, a lot of information theorists, very world famous, they, they look at this. Information theory, mutual information must play a role in the CNN understanding. Well, welcome study. You know, I'm not that good that you use a lot of information theory, but you're welcome. But this uses the cross entropy to measure the dimension, the discriminability of the dimension. Usually you put the cross entropy at the output. Measure the system discriminability. We want to lower the cross entropy, so make the system more discriminant. But you can also use the, the cross entropy inside the dimension and measure the discriminability. So once we do that, we find this uh, second convolution layer of the MNIST. The V4, the cross entropy, this is from high to low. So the V4, the cross entropy is higher than the green one, which is a BP. So BP actually has a, a lower cross entropy. It means the dimension in the BP actually has more discrete power. So that's just what confirmed what I said. But I use a mathematical uh, 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 the, the, the proof to, to show that. Okay, so now this is the um, 
then we have the interface between convolution and FC layer. So the, the convolution layer, we can sort of get a two layer and add some bias and so on. And then the, we don't need a DC. We can put a DC, uh, uh, throw away, and you only use the AC and so on. Um, so there is a flow chart, and there is a GitHub code. So the best way for you to go through the GitHub code. But here you can see it's a one pass, and then we use the co covariance structure of the patch five by five. Just study how the pixel correlate each other to define the filter. Okay, and then uh, pulling, uh, and then add bias. To, then we don't need uh, any rectification, no rectifier needed. And go to the next one, you have a, a cuboid, and you can study the correlation structure for all the elements, and you have PCA, and you design the filter, and you add, add the, uh, and so on. So no really, just one pass, and you get very powerful features. Okay, so now let's look at the second layer, the, the second part. So there's a two uh, FC layer and one output layer. So three fields of stage. So again, you can look at this just a back propagation as a parameter optimization, but also you can look. So how to interpret this FC layer? Really good way to look, it's really linearly square regression with some labels, okay? So here we start to use label. Before we don't use any label, we just use the covariance structure, but now we can use the label. So the, here this is the uh, convolution layer output, so it's 375 dimension. Each, each dot is one image, but one image I have now become a feature in the feature space, and the green dot means the same class, blue dot means that there's another class, red is another class. And then we try to do clustering so that we get a 120 cluster. So original 370, but we make 120 cluster. And if this is uh, a good feature, actually the cluster usually have pure, purity. If bad feature, then you, are, you will have some kind of mix. For example, this is uh, very good for the red, but uh, the green and, and the blue is tougher. So they have some kind of mix. But then each cluster I project to the uni vector of the 120 dimension space. Each cluster go to one uni vector. So here I do dimension reduction. And I also using clustering start to separate things. So I hope the cluster has uh, some purity. And it depends on the problem. So MNIST is an easy problem. We tend to see very pure, very easy clustering, get a very pure cluster. But CIFAR 10 is more difficult. So you see CIFAR 10 more like this. So all the points here or here, then we can put the left-hand side and right-hand side. So there are points here, these are the dimension. We put it, we put it here, and then the mapping, we put the one half vector, so one, zero, 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 one, zero, depends on the mapping uni vector. So we have a 120 uni vector put at the right hand side, and there is corresponding cluster feature put it here, and then we solve this least square regression. So A will be the uh, weighting, and W will be the bias. So in this case, the bias doesn't have to be constant. This bias can be different. And the most the value uh, you project, you try to project between uh, one, one, right? But usually the, the distribution between zero and two. So most are positive, but maybe a little bit negative. But in that case, you can do the radio, just rectify that. Get a slightly improved result. But most of the projection is between zero and two and center here. Okay, so this one will not come just, it will, it will be regression result will be something here. Okay, anyway. Um, and then why you want to go, not just direct go to 10? You need a 120, 84. Basically, there is intra-class variability. For example, snake, there are different kinds of snake. And then you have the architecture, this kind of called etiquette. There are different things. So you, you want to, even you have 10 classes, but you, you want to, in the middle, you want more classes, subclasses. So that's uh, uh, allow you to take account of the intra-class variability. So here, when I do training, I have a, a lot of zero, right? And then, because Lacan say you have 120, 120 choices, so each class I split to, use k-min to split to 12 subcluster. So zero, I have 12 subcluster, one and nine. So there's a real label, zero to nine, that's a real label. But dash one, dash two, dash 12 is my label. I use the k-min to create a pseudo label. So now each class has a real label plus pseudo label and 12, and total were 120, and then do the least square regression. 
And the next stage, 80, I can do similar thing. I can do real label and plus each real label follow eight different pseudo label and, and do, and eventually everyone go to the 10 real labels. Performance comparison. So here uh, I want to show the, um, this is the original LANET, exactly the, the LANET, and I use the MNIST. And here is to try to handle the uh, CIFA 10. So it's a color image. So I need to consider the color. So I um, let filter a little more. But basically, it's a follow exactly the same architecture, but change the filter number. So this is a result. So MNIST, you do the feed forward design once, one, once you get 97.2. And if you do the BP, you get 99.1. The difference is really very small. Here I use a hybrid. Hybrid means what? When I do the two convolution layer, I use the V4. So get the feature, right? The feature is not very powerful. But when I do the FC layer, I allow you the backward propagation. So use the code MLP. So you, you do the backward propagation in the FC layer. I'm able to make the decision quality better. So from 97.2, go to 98.4. But if I do the BP up to the convolution layer, then I can also improve feature quality. So I try to look at how much if I improve the uh, decision using BP. And also I, when I choose uh, improve the feature using BP, what's the improvement I can get? Okay. And similarly, CIFAR 10, so 62 to 64, 64 to 68. But again, this is just one pass, okay. And so, Actually, we still struggle, and I'm still not very happy. So actually, after my keynote speech at uh, uh, um, Athens, uh, the Greece, I went to Israel, Technion. And then I keep thinking the way to improve it. And then in Jerusalem, I started to think about ensemble method. Ensemble method means what? There are a lot of weak classifier. My V4 is a weak classifier. BP is like a strong classifier. BP is super soldier. The V4 design is a small element. You know, there's a movie with a small yellow man, right? You know, but there are a lot of small yellow, yellow men. So the smaller yellow man, how to fight the big giant transformer, right? You use more of them. So I have a weak classifier, but I can do many weak classifiers and work together, ensemble them. So that's one idea. There's a paper about that. If you want to see this, uh, this year, beginning. And then another idea is data partitioning. There are some easy samples. So I use the V4, I still can get a very, very good result. And there are some hard example. I get a worse result. And there is a very, very hard example. I, I get better result in a sense because the data is really very few. So statistically speaking, you have some majority. And then you have some minority, right, the outlier. And then you have even, even more minority, another outlier. But sometimes it works well because it's really data too few. So you probably overfit. But I can consider handle them separately. So easy one I can handle, and then the other one I can train the CN, or I train the V4 CN, try to handle hard, and then try to train another one. So anyway, so through the ensemble, um, this is no data partitioning, just the direct ensemble. This plus with the data partitioning. So anyway, the training accuracy like this, the testing accuracy, 99.3, using data partitioning and the, and, and the uh, ensemble is better than BP. And CIFAR 10, if you do this uh, uh, data partitioning plus the ensemble, the testing data is 76, is 8% uh, better than the backward propagation. So it means V4, I still have other way, so like ADAR boost, you know, that, those kind of bagging to make the performance better. Okay. So the conclusion base says, well, BP actually, um, the, all the parameter depends on the input images and the input label. So the influence of the input image and influence of the output label is global. They have influence this way, they have influence that. So this, if you want to get the optimized result, you really need to look at two. But if you change something here, you have to redo again. So it's really a headache. You know, you want to do the incremental learning, you need a lot of other tricks to handle it. But in our method, actually, the input is uh, just talk about pixel relationship. It has nothing to do with label. So different pixels have different kind of structure. So we can get the features after convolution layer, we get a feature here. And once the feature here, we, don't, we do the least square regression to do the FC layer. But actually, people also try. Once you get good features, you may give up the uh, MLP. You can replace with SVM. 
you can replace it with the random forest. Then it will be very good. It's because this square regression is a second class citizen of MLP because there's no backward propagation. But if you do the SVM here or do the random forest here, I can go to the first class citizen. You know what I mean? So I change the classifier to the SVM. I'm, I'm okay. So uh, here I try to be compatible with Lacan. Right? If I do something, I say, well, you are not doing the net five. So I'm doing the net five. So I follow that. But actually, I may not even like the net five. I will say bye bye to the net five after a while. Okay? So I do one, closely follow, but then I do next one, I will just give up the MLP. This talk about the power of the features. So this is the second uh, convolution layer. You see already that. Okay, now you see that this is the first uh, FC layer, second FC layer, and output. The 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 green one is the BP. So BP means there are some dimension extremely low cross entropy, means extremely discriminant. But then there are also a lot of features is really very bad. Mine actually the fee forward design, the feature discriminant power is more uniform distributed, flatter, and actually I I need to use not a single one, I need to use a combination of them, combination of them to get a high discrete power. But the, the BP really just rely on small set of the feature to do the, this, this, uh, to do the decision. Okay, so this is a comparison. BP is system-centric. If we borrow the data-centric, you do the linear, linear algebra statistics. Uh, this is very difficult, this kind of optimization. This is really very easy to think. There is no module, there's two module, the convolution and FC separated. Uh, vulnerability, I think uh, we are able to do more. Uh, if you build a CN, then it's about the same. Uh, once you CN, keep the weight, it's fixed. You can always attack. But if you don't do CN, the beginning you do the feature extraction, the second you do the SVM and so on, actually the system will be more robust. So actually we have more flexible architecture. We don't need to put the end to end network. And training complexity, this is much, much lower. And generalizability, it's hard to generalize. This actually it's also has a lot of potential. Actually, you know what's going on, and you can fix things. Debugging is uh, it's, uh, easy. OK, so uh, right now, BP provides very nice result, but there's a lot of issues people know. So from five years ago, you cannot answer. Today, you still cannot answer. Before design, uh, of course, still more work need to do. My urgent agenda is the CIFAR 100 and ImageNet. So when, when people say, you know, Professor Go, I like your talk, but you only talk at least in CIFAR 10. I'm not interested in that. I'm interested in this. at least give me the starting point, the ImageNet. Well, you will get ImageNet by the end of this year. Actually, I hope by the end of summer, you will get ImageNet. Okay? And I work extremely hard for that now. So uh, ensemble, you already show we get some ensemble ideas. And then we try to do this CIFAR 10 image net. And also, we can lower the computation much more. Because PC and least square regression, we, we can use some very representative sample and a much smaller sample set using statistic approach. You don't need to use all the data set. You can select a small data set to do that. So it can be even faster okay, so to, to design the filter weight. And also, I'm, I'm very interested in the RNN, you know, LSTM and GRU. Okay, so final, this is the final slides. Um, uh, no, I think there's a, there are two more slides. So basically, the weekly supervised is also very good because the label is very expensive. But when you do the BP design, you use the label to do, help you to do BP, right? But when you do V4, label really just uh, try to, at the last stage, help you to make decision. But also, we have clustering structure. Clustering actually help you a lot. So we can use clustering and then Select label. If things are clustered together, actually they are more similar. And then we can check the, some kind of uh, purity and so on. So the fee forward design actually has a, a way to match the weakly supervised system. Okay, so finally it's about the teaching of digital image processing. I've been uh, teaching this at the USC for 25 years. And then recently I started to feel how I'm going to teach, right? Because whenever there is a subject, denoising, and there is a data set, and there is a lot of CNN. And super resolution, there is a data set, a lot of CNN. So everything has a data set, a lot of things. So something not been polluted by CNN, very few. Like 3D reconstruction may not be polluted. But almost every field been polluted by CNN. 
So I just tell students, well, this data set and method, and then we select one and say, I, sorry, I don't know TensorFlow, I don't know Keras, TA, please come to teach student, and I go to the back and sleep, right? And then I can, every class, every subject introduce 10 minutes, and the rest I go back. And then I can do this for the whole semester. But you say, I'm teaching state of the art, CNN, right? But I don't know student, how much student learn. They may love this approach, but I think student learn almost zero. Up to all the semester, they may remember several CNN, but after several years, all this memory is useless. I can sort of predict that. Okay, so anyway, uh, then how I justify, I teach old stuff. How I justify Kenny edge detector, how I justify it. How I justify some kind of bilinear interpolation. Now it's super religion, so good. Why you need bilinear interpolation? How I justify it? After some thinking, actually the answer is we need to find harmony between old and new. The old is data independent. Kenny edge detection, you know, the, the, a lot of uh, binomial interpolation. This is all mathematical model, but you assume something, something smooth, something, you know, some structure, and then you know reason. And it doesn't work, you know it doesn't work because the assumption fails, right? So this is data independent model. It's simple, effective for majority. Majority means for easy sample. So there is a statistic. This block actually is easy because you use the model, it's okay. But the world is very big. There are a lot of outlier exceptions, and then the, this model cannot handle. Then, of course, this, mo this the performance will not be 99, right? The performance may be 80, but there are 20% cannot cover. Then you start to get data, and using the data-driven. And data-driven, you have to use it carefully, otherwise this is black box. But this is like, you know what's going on. And this part also, you want to know what's going on. And data-driven will become more expensive. But you know, if you want to do a good job for difficult data, you need data-driven, and you need a smart data-driven. So I, I don't think that there's anything wrong with the standard curriculum about the image processing and so on. It still works for, and also a lot of insight you still need. Non-local non -local mean, I love it, right? Even if it's not the CNN, non-local mean has a lot of good math. So, that's basically my answer, so to address my conscience, right? When I teach students, I really want to teach students a good thing. I don't want to teach students the old fashion thing, right? Okay, so these are the, uh, some uh, students help me to do some experiments. There are some archive. Actually, the paper also accepted by the Journal of Visual Communication and Image Representation. Okay, I think that that's the end. Thank you.